Welcome to our Montana. I'm Mike Penfold. Right now I'm standing in the middle of the Crow Reservation. This is Prior Creek down below us. The Indians call it Arrow Creek uh, and they have an Indian name uh, for it too but basically it means Arrow Creek. This is the site of a battle that was an extremely important piece of history of the Crow Indians. This is where they fought for the survival of their tribe. The place where I'm standing here is just covered with uh, Indian teepee rings. Probably, oh, 125 years ago, this place had been covered up with, with teepees, with people hunting buffaloes and these buffalo and elk and these uh, hillsides all, all around us. Probably we would have seen meat drying in the, in the sun and pemmican being uh, made. Uh, the choke cherries and wild plums are ripe right now. It was a perfect time for gathering food. But in 1860, or maybe 1861, in that period, the Sioux and Northern Cheyenne and the Arapaho had put together a huge alliance. Those tribes were getting heavily pushed by immigrants from, uh, from the east. And this Crow had the best uh, uh, country in, in uh, the best kind of country you could possibly imagine for their kind of lifestyle. Lots of elk, lots of buffalo, mountain waters, cottonwood trees in the in the uh, uh, coolies and the, and the grasslands. So just a beautiful, perfect place. The Sioux and the Crow had been longtime enemies. They fought all the time. And they finally decided uh, to come over here and take over the Crow Reservation. They intended to kill all the warriors and, and, and capture the men and the children and, and make them uh, Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho uh, Indians. This is where a battle took place that settled that that argument. We had a chance to study this uh, quite a few years ago and we did it by interviewing Indian elders. One of the elders that was interviewed, not by us, but by the BIA was Joe Medicine Crow. He was probably 96 at the time he did this interview. Joe was a fascinating, highly respected uh, Crow historian. Uh, he uh, is considered the last warrior chief of the Crow Indians. Uh, to be a warrior chief, you had to do certain kinds of things to at, 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 attain those credentials. One is you had to count coup on an enemy. Two, you had to take his, his uh, weapons. And three, you had to capture some of his horses. Well, Joe was a scout in World War II, and he came around the corner of a, of a building, and lo and behold, there's a German soldier which he had a fight with. He subdued the soldier, he took away his weapon, he let the soldier go, and later on Joe captured 36 German horses and rode off into the sunset with these German horses. So Joe met all the credentials of being a war chief of the Crow Indians. But more than that, he had, he's received so many Bronze Star and oh, so many war, uh, medals during the war, and then they gained the huge respect from Crow and non-Crow people in the West. Joe tells the story of this battle of Arrow Creek, and I think it's worth listening to. This is, this is classic Joe Medicine Crow uh, storytelling. It's, it's something you don't want to miss. Gentlemen, we are here at a very historic place. We are here in about the middle of the Crow Indian country. Well, a very, very serious undertaking was attempted here. I would say this happened about 1860, 61, And the battle itself was planned about a year, maybe even longer than a year, a year ahead of time. It was planned for the sole purpose of destroying the Code people as a tribe and take the land. The Dakota people were making these plans at the time because they were being pushed out of their homelands in Minneapolis uh, area, Minnesota area, Dakotas, they were being pressured out of there, being crowded out this way. So they decided that the Crow country is still wide open, a lot of game, food here, that uh, they would come and take this land. 
but they have to get rid of the clothes first. So that was on the origin of this battle here that finally took place about 1860, 61, around there. Now, I am now 86 years of age, and I've been hearing about this battle from various sources for most of my life, I guess. I recall old storytellers, you know, talk about the intertribal war days, that battle here and that one here, and, and of course they would mention this battle here, which is called the place or the time where the whole tribe, Crow tribe was surrounded. Akjoda. Akjoda means where the whole tribe. Akjoda menachtikyo. Menachtikyo means surrounded. Well, the whole tribe is surrounded. Mm. Now, <clears throat> this actually wasn't the whole tribe at the time. It was a, uh, a group consisting of about 400 lodges. And the river crows were already up north. And the main mountain, so-called mountain crows, were still further west. But this is part of the mountain crows <laughs> that were involved here. Now, <clears throat> the story that I used in my little book was derived from a probable historian, storyteller, by the name of Charles Ten Bears, Charlie Ten Bears. He told me the Sioux version, and this was in the early 1950s, I think, that I got this story, that I used a recording machine and got the whole story. Also, in the 1930s, I brought an old storyteller by the name of Joe, Joe Child in the mouth, calling Joe Child. <clears throat> I came with him up here, we sat right here, or someplace right here. And then he told me the Crow version, as, as he uh, got it from his father, child in the mouth. He would say, my father was involved in that battle, and he would tell it over and over again ever since I was a little boy. And I know that story so well that I often thought that I was in a battle myself. Anyhow, I got his version. So I put the two versions together. But uh, probably we should start with the Sioux version. It happened this way. A war party was organized to come into the Crow country to probably capture horses and so forth, you know, pound corn. Oh. So they came. They came here and, of course, they were quickly conf <laughs> confronted by the Crow warriors, and they had a battle. And there was a young man, outstanding young Dakota man, who was just becoming a young chief, got some war deeds, and he was on his way to establish a big career in inter-tribal warfare. Nice looking, come from a good family. So he was killed here in the Crow Country. And his comrades retrieved his war bonnet and some of his equipment, took it home. Took it home, gave them to his mother. Mother was, of course, heartbroken. She went into mourning. She would go from time to time, almost every evening, that she would get one of uh, her lost son's horses, war horses, put his saddle and equipment and would leap uh, and his war bottle on the horse and would lead that horse through the camp, wailing, challenging some young Dakota man to take the horse and make vengeance upon the crow of Sarokin. 
kept doing that, and no one would take the challenge. Finally, she she got uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> had become a problem to the head man there, chiefs. They didn't like it. Says this is no good. She's overdoing it. When you overdo a thing like this, it comes back at you. So they would approach her and beg her practically, and even offer her the right to smoke it and quit. Best to quit. But she wouldn't listen. Just kept doing it. Well, they were getting awful concern, didn't know what to do with it. Well, one day the horse was taken. And here's a, another little story. There was a young man who was uh, courting a, a young maiden there was going to marry her. So according to tradition, he informed his mother, aunt, sister, that he's going to marry that certain girl over there. The response was negative. No comment. Finally, one, one of them said, no, I don't think we want her in the family. In other words, they knocked the idea in the head and he left. And he was heartbroken, wondering what to do. Finally, he decided to commit suicide. Some tribes do commit suicide. The Cheyennes do, but the Crows don't. Anyhow, he's thinking about committing suicide. And then one evening, got the idea that her grieving mother was leading that horse there and challenging, oh, here's the end. I'll take that horse. I'll be committing suicide, all right, but in a good way, dramatic way. So, walked up there and was going to get it. <clears throat> so, only one evening she came there and Young man, I've forgotten his name. I think it's in that little book of mine. Came there and he walked up there with that for the news spread quickly. Someone took the horse. Oh, the people started running up there. Who was the boy? And there he was, leading that horse. And that was quite a dramatic moment for the whole tribe. I suppose the uh, Head men, leading men were <laughs> quite relieved that finally this thing is coming to some kind of a conclusion. Anyhow, so <clears throat> the head men decided to talk this thing over then. So they called the council to discuss this situation. So it looks like this woman, we have asked her to sees her mourning and what, what she's been doing. It's all we're doing. It. And it's calling for bad luck. But now, the horse has been taken, but it doesn't mean that the thing's going to end right here. She's overdoing it to a point where all of us are in danger. But we might have bad luck, so we better talk about that. So they did. Well, she, Shall we do? Shall we just send out a war policy, kill a few crows and let it go at that, or shall we do a, a, a big job? Talk back and forth. Finally, all right, said. <clears throat> they decided, said. Here's what we're going to do now. We're going to take one ear, all moons, to think about it and work on it. Because if we go over there, so you know how those crows are. There are not too many of them, but boy, they're quite the warriors. It is always a dangerous thing to go there. So we must be well organized so they can defeat them. Now, as you know, they said, we're being pushed out of our country here. A buffalo killed all. Being pushed out of there, 
and uh, we got to move. We got to find a better place to live. And the Crow Indians still have that touch of place. Still wide open. They still have buffalo, elk, deer, lots of food up there. And uh, the, the white men haven't gotten there. They usually stay away from them. Trapper. So, said, the time has come. We are forced to do this. Go take that land. There are not too many of them, but if we get together and get organized, we can take it. Kill a warrior. All right, so they decided that winter to send emissaries to the various Sioux bands. You know, there's a lot of them up there, about a dozen of them. Many Kaiyus, Teton, and all these other groups. <clears throat> each group, each band is probably about big or larger than a whole Crow tribe. So it's a huge <clears throat> tribe of people up there. And so they sent 11 uh, emissaries to each band. So said, all right, you go up there and stay there one whole year. If you have to marry a woman there and be a part of them, but gradually tell them what we have planned to do. Don't rush into it. Do it easily, quietly, and uh, <clears throat> sell them the idea. Otherwise, they might back off. So they left. Come back in one year. In one year, if things are going to work out all right, so you bring your group to the forks of Goose Creek here <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> on the, in the foot of the Bighorn Mountains. Goose Creek. It's right here in Wyoming. It's so these two forks. Goose Creek meet there. We will meet there. And uh, the cheapest in form of the observer. See if they're going to come or not, so we can make final arrangements for those who will show up. So it took one whole year to work this thing out. Then, this sponsoring group, I don't know which group, I think I probably mentioned it in my little book, <clears throat> moved over there first and camped there and waited, and you know, they started coming in, this group, that group. Try it. Camp got larger and larger. And almost to the junction of Goose Creek to <clears throat> Tongue River and almost to the foot of the mountain. Uh, huge, huge camp. And in my own estimation, it's probably the largest gathering of Plains Indians at any one place at any one time. So called big. I threw camp at the Battle of Little League because that's just a drop in the bucket. This was huge. They were serious. So they came there and camped there. And it would take the town crowd to start from one end to the other end and back changing horses for about time. It's that huge. Anyhow, they finally got there, <clears throat> and head men of, from each band would come together to the sponsoring tribe, and they at the council meeting several days in a row. I suppose how are we going to do this? And so forth. In the meantime, they sent out scouts check on the movements of the over oh, there. And they found a group right near Sheridan in Pasquick, south, about uh, 10 miles south of a little town, Wyola, Montana, up in Pasquick. There they were. A band of about 400 lodges, close with there. Oh, they're right here, just a little ways from us. So they had to work fast. All right. <clears throat> so we'll go there. We'll follow catch up with them and wipe them out, and then we'll take their land. And when we get there, when the fight's on, 
kill all the men he can. Kill them all. But say the boy will raise them as Dakota warriors. And save their women, daughters, and young wives. We'll marry them and raise more warriors. But the men, we got to kill them all. So that was a basic under bottom line of this big war expedition, something like Genesis Khan's <laughs> excursions into <laughs> southeastern Europe. All right. So they're right here, not too far here. So they went, oh, for the last time, they got together to arrange the final movement. One man rose. So you all know me. As Night Horse, chief of the Arapaho. But you don't know that I'm a Crow Indian by birth. I was taken by the Arapaho race, by good families. Now I'm a Arapaho chief, Night Horse. Says, what you are doing here, what you are planning to do, is not right. You are planning to exterminate the people, kill them, take their land. That's not the Indian way. That's not a good way. That's something evil. I don't want to be a part of such a thing. So if I'm leaving right now. I'm leaving, breaking camp. But I'm saying to my people here, warriors, if they want to stay and join this thing, it's up to them. But with me and my immediate family, I'm leaving, walked out, packed up and took off that evening, headed towards uh, Big Horn Mountains or someplace. That evening, I stopped there, so all right, got two sons. said, you run over there to that camp over here, not too far from here, and tell them what's going to happen. Tell them to move at once and join the larger camps up here to the west, you know, mountain coast. For the west and the course river coast is quite a ways north. The go now, so well, these boys took off, you know. Road <clears throat> during that night and early in the morning they found the camp and here they come. Immediately they were noticed and four warriors jumped on their horses and went <clears throat> after them and caught them, but uh, they knew enough crow so they stopped them you now. So they brought them two boys to the camp there to the head men and I said we come our father night horse has sent us here to warn you oh yeah they remembered night horse they knew him when he was a boy and now knew him as a chief over there yeah yeah they knew him said uh, <clears throat> we were with a huge <clears throat> Gathering of Dakota people, bands, a lot of them there. Tomorrow there, they're probably on the way now. They're coming, wake you up, kill everyone. Our father has a, told, <clears throat> told us to tell you to move right away and flee fast as we can get away from here. So that's what we've got to tell you. And some men said, all right, Shush. I'm glad you have come here. I gave them two, two fresh horses to get right back. But some, you know, there's always some mordelic guys around. Oh, we're brave. Crow warriors, we're not about to run away from Dakota. Let them come. All that. No. We're moving. So they quickly packed up and headed west, you know. By that time, the Sioux started moving. Phew! They were so confident. I need a drink here. They were so confident that uh, they're going to accomplish their evil plans. 
So a lot of old men came along, old retired warriors to come to look on the big victory, the demise of their sorrow. Also, a lot of women came, three daughters and wives of these warriors. They want to be on hand, hearing things. I'll tell you what. So they have a big entourage of aliens and warriors. Now, come back to <clears throat> this young man who <clears throat> was telling the story. This man who, whose marriage was uh, was postponed indefinitely, and he was heartbroken. Oh no, but he was the one who took the horse. But this other story, same sort of a thing. Now, the uh, guy he, he was going to come just look on, but he didn't have a horse. He had one whole gray back horse, slow. Could never make it, so he was wanting to go. The horde was already on the move, and people joining in, you know, kind of a festive picnic feeling occasion, you know. So he was running on, found his uh, brother's horse. His brother had a real good war horse and a buffalo horse. Could run all day past. So he was going to take his brother's horse, and his brother wasn't around. I think his brother was already in the in a <coughs> party there, but he left his war uh, buffalo horse, so he went up there and he's <laughs> gonna get ready to go. And his sister-in-law came and said, "What are you doing?" So I'm gonna join the bull war party. So you stay away from that horse. That horse is our meat, the source of meat, brings meat. You're not worthy to even touch that horse. Stay away from that. So, boy, that, that hurt his feelings. So he was determined to go. He was kind of suicidal, too. So I'm going to go anyhow, some way. Anyhow, so he got on his old horse and followed along. And then uh, caught up with his brother, you know, got, let that old horse go and gave him he brought a couple extra horses. And get on this one. So it was a <clears throat> the man who actually told the story about the battle here. So he he had become part of the war party. So we came. He said. And uh, I might explain here a little bit that this Charles Tenbear used to live with a a, a family up uh, past Creek, Yellow Crane. Yellow Crane, you've heard of that name. Mm -hmm. But this Yellow Crane used to live over there. So Charlie was there taking care of the old man's horses during the winter. He'd stay with him. And a man and his wife from Pine Ridge would come over during the summer, of course, wagon, and stay with Yellow Crane. His wife would uh, dig uh, wild turnip, carrots, and uh, pick cherries, berries, they stay here in the fall, would go back. Sometimes they stay here all winter. And uh, he used to tell about this battle here. So I was in it. So he would tell it quite often. So that's where Charlie Tenberg got the true version. And I was lucky. I casually asked Charlie Ruff, <laughs> uh, Tenbears one time, you know anything about the big battle in Clark Hall? I've heard that so many times from the foods that uh, I know all about. Well, tell me. So I set up my <laughs> tape recorder, reel to reel. And then we sat there always taping that story right from the beginning. <clears throat> Anyhow, it's a long story, but we'll come quickly. <clears throat> they came. Came to Pass Creek. Those were already gone. Their camp was they were smoldering. They just left, so they continued. Continued headed this way towards Lodge Grass or whatever. Probably right about where we come from. 
and then they found another campsite, and they were gone already. They were just about a day's travel ahead of them. So they came to Bighorn River, right below Fort Smith. There's a good crossing there called Spotted Rabbit Crossing. There's a, a ledge there, a rock ledge. Water's not deep. You can cross easily. Well-known Bozeman Trail cross there, too, by the way. Yeah. Anyhow, the crows crossed the river and camped there on the west side of the Bighorn River, right across from Fort Smith. There's a big alfalfa field there now that they crop. So that's where they, where they camp for the night. Early in the morning, before daybreak, they packed up and continued coming westward. And shortly after, probably um, uh, two or three hours later, here comes the, the Sioux Horde. They came there and crossed the river, and their campfires were still smoldering here and there. So wait a minute. Stop right there. The head man, or well, maybe head men. All right, so we'll, we'll estimate the size of their fighting men. So, so. I want ten men with rifles. Come here. Ten of them showed up and said, all right, you stay right here in that campsite. Ten more. Well, they all the uh, <coughs> campsites, 400, about 400 campsites. That's a good-sized camp, by the way. All were allocated with ten men with rifles. And look back, and here the remainder was even larger. Men were still at the guns, and some, some, of course, he was bone arrows, tomahawks, and spears, was even larger. So already, in one pro campsite, you could estimate three men that still fight. The old man, well, he, son, maybe two sons. Maybe there was a boy who was able to fight. So at the average, it's three to ten already, and the remainder of the Sioux <coughs> party was even larger, which would mean probably a ratio of a dozen or even more to quarter warrior to one crow warrior, old man, young man, a regular warrior. So that's the odds really stacked against the crow. Are you going to change that, or you all right? All right. Then, the man turned around and said, All right, so say a hole. Boy, all the warriors gave a big war. Mm. Right, war. They say that whole valley shook. <laughs> so there's a huge, huge battle for them. So once again, the head man said, Tomorrow, this time, no more of sorrow. Remember, don't kill their boys. Just some fighting men. Got a job to do. But you know that not too many, but they're, <laughs> they're pretty good fighters. So it's not going to be easy, but uh, we'll get it. And they started out, probably uh, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, maybe. So they came. Got dark, and it was a good ride from there to here, about 50 miles or so. Came there that night. In the meantime, the crows came and kept right here. Some down there, I suppose, some on top here. They were camped here, but they were already... They probably sent back scouts to check, you know, so they knew that, that they were in serious trouble, so they better get out of here. So they would camp here that evening, light camp, ready to move quickly in the morning, daybreak. All right, daybreak came, and they were started breaking camp here. And one man by the name of hits himself over the head. 
hitched himself over the head. Floyd Realbert carried on that name until he died not long ago. He lost his horses, so he decided to go back. Maybe they went back that way. So he jumped on his horse and went up the high hill to that one thing. Went up there on the other side of this high hill. Went over there and, oh boy, there was a sight in front of him. That was fantastic. The whole oh, area they had kind of spoken about that way. Just covered, wired, already in the process of putting on their war paints and all, getting ready, because they knew the cat was scared now. Here they are. So there they were, moving around, and you know, painting themselves, their horses, singing their power songs, whatever. And they were just ready to start when he saw it and turned around and headed down here, fast. Right across here, he started hollering, you know, so they knew. Give the stress signal, hollering, certain way. So people uh, probably gathered, wondering what's going on. And the man came there and to the head man's place or where they were gathered and told him, said, get this right over the hill. And the head man said, all right, said, call for four men, quickly, said. These were four brave, pro warriors, good horses, always well mounted. But you run up there and check for sure. So they did. They rode up there and went over that hill, and they, the party was still there. They haven't gotten on their horse. So they came there, and instead of looking and turning right back, they charged you. Rode along the front lines and fired into them and headed this way. Then the charge was on. Then the hail shook. So they came down one of these ridges and headed this way, and right behind them, here comes a huge wave, probably one of those hills covered black with horses. So these four men, in the, in the meantime, well, the head men knew they were in trouble. So they probably made plans already. Now, I'm going to sort of change my story a little bit, use a crow, crow version, but I'll come back to the main crow version. But you know, right about where the hail, uh, bales are, right here in that bottom there, was a line of crow warriors. They was formed like <laughs> the British Army. Whereas up to that time, you know, intertribal warfare was a individual uh, thing, individual sort of a thing. And <clears throat> so the headman said, now, said, we're not going to charge out there and try to calm coup and all that. That's, that's no place to do it right now. we got to survive. So they placed these men down there. I think the front men were the ones with the rifles. And behind them, the ones with their arrows, or maybe the other way. But anyhow, they form a battle line, which is kind of an unusual way for Plains Indians to fight. But they had to do it. So they were all lined up, probably some down here on this side of the ridge. Quick, though. That quick used to come right through here. You know. 1904, when they built the railroad, they put the quick on the other side. <clears throat> so there's a quick here. So they were pretty well in line somewhere on top here. And in the meantime, the women folks ran out there to the flat, middle part of that flat there, and put up their teepee poles like that together, and their flat teepee covers all tied together into form of a temporary shelter for fortification, fortress. And they stack all the equipment, bar places, whatever, along the walls of there, and even dug, uh, trenches along so the kids were in there and, the, and they were in there all of them were in there like you said, I suppose most of them many of so they were right out here and years ago when I first came here the kids were still there but they were bothered over but anyhow they were ready here they were ready here and some were here and some young boys were way at the tip of you know that I think plenty of coups 
grandfather and them were just teenagers, 12, 13. They were over there. And all along here, there are rocks. Eh? There's used to be piles. But there's only uh, a small one over here now. So they were set. They were set. There comes the horde. So they came there to the edge of the creek there, and they stopped. They stopped momentarily. In the meantime, the rest were still coming down. So I suppose they were going to hit the camp here in, in mass. So they were still coming off. And in the meantime, the cheering section took positions over there on that cliff uh, over there. The old men sitting there smoking, and the women you know, sitting around there too, cheering, you know, giving the women's little water, shrilling. So they were all set. Then they was on. This young man who took that horse had put on the, <clears throat> the, the war bond that came with the horse, put it on there and wrote that his horse or war clubs or fields or whatever, just like that original owner. He was leading the charge. So he crossed the creek someplace down here, maybe down there. Across the creek and headed to the coal line. Headed there and then pulled back. Turned around and headed back. By that time, two crow Indians jumped on their horses and chased them. And they caught up with him. Fast horses. They caught up with him before he got back to the creek. And he slipped under his horse's neck like the old Plains Indian warriors do. Somehow they get under their horse's neck. I think they have a rope tied around and they wedge themselves in there. And that's where they're out of sight, except their feet. So that's what he was doing. Horse going full speed down that down that hill. And these two crew crow with crow warriors caught up with him. And one of them's a dead shot with a bow and arrow. <clears throat> Got his horse running this way to the side a little bit. And Son and narrow, you know where he hit the man? Bullseye. Hit him right in his seat. Come out, sticking out of it. Roll over. And the horse left. And there he was. And in the meantime, the other man, they stopped there quickly. The other man took his <laughs> knife and scalped him. Crows usually just uh, don't really scalp, they just take a braid or a, or a small uh, piece, this piece of scalp. But the Sioux generally do the whole, the whole scalp job. So that's what they did to that man. They got cut hair on, put a plump it out, took it at the war, the court of warriors. Said, All right, here's your leader. Now the rest of you come. I'm going to do this to all of you. Said it in sign language, I suppose. And they came back, then the battle broke. Here they come. Then it was on. So they came charging to the front line, then they opened up. Modern wave. Arrows. Guns. And stopped. They turned around and went back. Went back and regrouped and came back again. Several charges like that. And a group, the court of warriors were coming up that hill and these boys were right there waiting for them. The little bow and arrows. They killed one. They won the court of warriors and they stopped them there. <clears throat> and then the battle was on. Now, I will switch to the close story. Full version. There are many versions. It was such a huge and exciting thousands of horses, warriors mixing around there, just flying. It's impossible for any one individual clothes to say it all. It's really safe. 
quite still now. And uh, this story that uh, got me from the cold, Joe Charles, the story of his father, that he was all around here, you said. So uh, I'll take his story now. That's the one I used. And so these other boys, I uh, used their grandfather's version or whatever. And uh, they insist that uh, their grandfather's story was, was a true version. So even so, our modern Pro stories tellers kind of contradict each other there. <clears throat> but I'm sticking with my pro uh, informant, Joe Cowles. He was a good storyteller. And we sat here. Look. <clears throat> so the battle was on. After they were repulsed several times. This was getting dangerous. They were running out of ammunition down there. Nailed. It's getting serious. So one man said, rode forward or walked forward and making some kind of a sign. And they stopped there. They usually do that. They stopped there. He got close enough. Maybe he could talk Sioux or, or some Sioux understand Crow. Similar language. But anyhow, he told him in sign language, probably. All right. said, you have come a long way. Many, many of you have come. You've come here to do battle. That's obvious. And today, you're going to fight that battle. We're going to fight you. Already, we have sent word, writers, to all the groups. They're coming. They're on the way here. They'll be here before long. And when they get there, good he get here, we're going to give you a fight. We're going to take your scalp. So he was, he was just stalling for time, actually. Bluffing them. Maybe they might say to quit. So, that was that. Then, these mysterious things started happening. The men up there send word down here quickly. So they're coming now. They're coming. So below here, they're coming up the valley here. A horde. What happened there? One of these mistakes things. Herd of elk down there. Huge herd. That time there were elk, bottomland animals. So the whole bunch got excited with all this firing going on and milling around there and uh, raising dust. And from a distance, you could see the white rubs and looked like well, war bodies all over there. Dust flying and looked like a war. Oh, they're on the way. So they send words that they're coming now. And whether they made a charge or not, I don't know, but shortly after, they send word again. They're coming from the west. They could see that up there on the ridge, that high ridge way over there. They saw a huge dust flying. And they could see what they thought were riders running around every which way. And these were buffaloes. All this sight firing around got them excited. So they were milling around there. They say, here they come. And I suppose by that time they were beginning to <laughs> have doubts. And whether they charge again, I don't know. But here is occupation interest that day was. And they cleared the sagebrush there with a sagebrush a cafe and all the hospital. And all. That was all sagebrush, flat. And they cleared up the strip there of sagebrush, skate. And an airplane come from something, <laughs> small thing, would land there, you know. And people would get on it and they'd take off. Oh, I spend more time watching that airplane come. Take off, I'd run on the side with my horse and carry it. But anyhow, I'd stop long enough to see that the battle up there was so realistic there that I took off. Uh, <laughs> Headed for the camp, you know, I thought, 
think they might kill me, them soldiers up there. Anyhow, that was quite, a, quite an event, 1923. Now, in the evening, now, at that time, uh, which is that spoke in front of teepees telling stories, how about that battle way down the muscle sky, oh, this and here and that, they exchange stories about certain important battles, you know, and uh, <laughs> exchange notes, so to speak. And we, that's where we got about a description of old battle. <clears throat> Anyhow, well, in one, there were a group, they're telling a story, and one Dakota man said, I want to ask you, Crow, something. I said, if that man up there at Pride Creek Battle still living, he'd be an old man now. I said, he ought to sit him there in the finest place in the lodge under the shade, get him the finest cut of meat, cut nice little pieces, and take your fork and put it in his mouth. Honor him. He was the one who saved you, Peter. Oh, such a, who is he talking about? Then? Nobody. First time we ever heard that story. So as far as they knew, that they didn't know anything about the buffaloes up here or the elk up here or that uh, rider of that bay pinnacle. Then they put the two stories together. It was that old lady who went out there and asked old man Tai to come back once. He sure did came down that <clears throat> bench, uh, World War monitor, chased the whole huge horde of blue warriors back, trailed on to the Black Hills. So that to me, is one of the most dramatic intertribal warfare that ever occurred out here in the Indian country. So-called custom battle, kids play, compared with this one. And a handful of Crow Indians that repulsed the largest gathering of Plains Indian warriors that had ever gotten together. So that's why I regard this place as I'm a sacred. Sacred things happen here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here telling you stories. So I'm proud of the place. Whenever I come here, I have a reverent feeling. And I would say to myself in a way, it's a hope. A hope for that woman there. Eh? A hole for that writer. A hole that first maker has protected us all along, that we still own our land here. That are the very heart of our co countries right here. It's still here, it's still a good country. Still got lots of wild animals to eat. Good roots to dig, cherries to pick now, and our mother nature has blessed us with a good place. Just like a chief said, Chief Adafruit said in 1843 to Robert Camel, leading a party of beaver trappers coming to a pro camp there at Muddy Gap. Northern Wyoming chief said, you have now come to my country, pro country. It is a good country because the first maker made it just right. Put it to the exact move the right place. And gave it to his favorite children. They have sorrow for him. 